In this video, I'll simplify everything that you need to know about the various antibody isotypes. This is in my immunology series. So if this is the first video in the immunology series that you're watching, I suggest you start from the beginning. When we say isotype, we're referring to the actual antibody subtype. For example, IgM versus IgG versus IgA versus IgE versus IgD. Let's start with IgM. IgM is the most important in terms of its structure. You can see the image and the structure on the right-hand side of this slide. IgM is pentameric, meaning that it has 10 antigen binding sites. Because of this, it is said to have high avidity. And don't get the term avidity confused with the term affinity. Avidity means that it has an excessive amount of binding sites. It has 10 avid binding sites. It has high avidity. IgM is expressed as a monomer on all immature B cells. And so one way to think about IgM is that it's sort of the default isotype because it is expressed on the immature B cells before any type of differentiation occurs. IgM is expressed in the primary immune response and it does fix complement. What you need to know for USMLE and COMLEX is its pentameric structure its default nature as your default isotype, and its high avidity, which is a feature secondary to its pentameric structure. So when it comes to IgM, just remember that IgM has many binding sites. You can also remember the M in pentameric. IgM, M for meric, M for many binding sites. That's the most important thing to know. As far as clinical associations go, IgM is associated with hyper-IgM syndrome. Now, this is due to decreased CD4L on the Th2 CD4 cells. And this is why it's really important to start at the beginning of my immunology playlist. If CD40 ligand cannot bind, that means that you lose the co-stimulatory signal, which is responsible for encouraging class switching. Because IgM is sort of the default isotype, if you don't get class switching, you never are able to change IgM into other isotypes. And because of that, you have increased levels of IgM. Again, think about this as the immature B cells are sort of stuck because they have IgM expressed on those immature B cells. Due to the inability to go through that co-stimulatory signal, there's no class switching, there's no differentiation, you're stuck with whatever you have as a default, which again is IgM. So in hyper-IgM syndrome, you have, as the name implies, too much IgM. And if we take that one step further, when you're taking USMLE or COMLEX, you're going to have decreased levels of IgG, IgA, and IgE. And because of that, you have increased infections that would otherwise be combated by those differentiated isotypes. So we see increased pneumocystis infections, increased crypto infections, and increased CMV infections. That's what you need to know about IgM. Now let's contrast that with IgG. IgG is the most abundant antibody in the serum, and that in the serum part is important because it's not the most abundant antibody by itself, it's the most abundant in the serum. IgG binds most strongly to antigen. And because of that, IgG has the greatest affinity. Now here we have a very important distinction between IgM and IgG. IgM had the greatest avidity. IgG has the greatest affinity. Avidity has to do with its binding sites because IgM is pentameric. Affinity has to do with how strongly it binds to antigen because IgG is expressed in the secondary immune response and therefore it has that really strong affinity that's needed to combat reoccurring infection. IgG also fixes complement, and clinically of note, it crosses the placenta and is the isotype that's responsible for hemolytic disease of the newborn. So when you think IgG, remember that it's great at binding. IgG, the G for great at binding, that will help you memorize that this has the greatest affinity. And you can take that one step further. If you know that it has a great affinity, it's going to be excellent in the secondary immune response. IgA is very, very high yield for USMLE and COMLEX. IgA is involved in mucosal defense. So if you're taking a test question and you're dealing with secretions, 
GI tract from Pyre's patches or respiratory tract. These are mucousy secretions, things that are wet. That equals IgA. So mucosal defense or any area of the body with mucosa or something that seems wet, that's IgA. For whatever reason on exams, the test writers like you to know that IgA is a dimer joined by a J chain. That's high yield, just memorize it, don't worry about it. You can see an image on the right hand of the slide of what that actually looks like. And of note, when IgA is in circulation, it's actually just a monomer. But when it's secreted, it's a dimer with a J chain that does show up. Now the highest yield part of IgA, besides its mucosal defense, is the clinical association with IgA deficiency. Now if the test writer wants to test you on IgA deficiency, you're going to be given one of four things. One, a false negative celiac test. Two, its association with other autoimmune conditions. Three, anaphylaxis if a patient with IgA deficiency undergoes blood transfusions or recurrent sinopulmonary infection and allergy, eczema, and asthma. So these are associations with IgA. You want to know that IgA a for allergy, A for asthma, A for autoimmunity, A for anaphylaxis, and A for abnormal HCG or celiac. And of note, you can see on this slide I wrote false negative celiac. You can also get a false negative pregnancy test. In short, the celiac test is looking at IgA antibodies. It is a specific subtype of IgA antibodies. And obviously, if somebody has an IgA deficiency, then the celiac test, which is looking at a specific subtype of IgA antibodies, in this case, IgA TTG, it's not going to be able to detect if that antibody is positive. Because even if the person truly has celiac, because of their IgA deficiency, they won't make the antibodies that this test is testing for. And so a very high yield thing to know for USMLE and COMLEX, especially as it relates to step two and level two, is that if you have a patient with IgA deficiency and you're testing them for celiac, you need to use IgG TTG antibody testing. Again, if you were to use incorrectly IgA TTG antibodies, it would be negative, even if they truly do have celiac disease. So that's very, very high yield. Anaphylaxis with blood transfusions, also extremely high yield, but I don't see that showing up as much as that false negative celiac and the association with other autoimmune conditions. So that's your IgA deficiency. Again, just note the A for all of the things that you see here. Now, don't get that confused with IgE because IgE is also associated with allergies. IgE is located on the mast cell surface and it binds basophils. When it's exposed to allergen, it undergoes cross-linking and you get the involvement of type 1 hypersensitivity reactions, increased release of histamine and tryptase. So these are all associations and buzzwords that you want to put in the same compartment of your brain as IgE. This is associated with allergies, eosinophilia, and helminthic infections. Very, very important to know helminthic infections. Clinically, IgE is associated with hyper IgE syndrome. This is also known as job syndrome. And IgE is the lowest concentration isotype in the serum. Now let's look at hyper IgE or job syndrome. This is due to a STAT3 mutation which decreases Th17 cells. This is why I encourage you to start at the beginning of my immunology series. But as you'll recall from a recent video, TH cell differentiation, when you get to TH17 cells, they help control neutrophil chemotaxis. And so in job syndrome, when there's this STAT3 mutation decreasing the pathway through which you generate TH17 cells, less neutrophil chemotaxis confers a host of symptoms and a higher risk of certain type of infections. Now, on the lab findings on USMLE or COMLEX, you will see as the name implies, increased levels of IgE and increased levels of associated eosinophils. You will see decreased levels of interferon gamma. Clinically, you will see the following. Atopic dermatitis, increased staphylococcal infections, which usually will show up on your exam as abscesses, pulmonary infections, coarse facies, retained primary teeth, eczema, 
and fractures, which are, which are due to decreased bone density. So aside from just the immunological findings, the mutation that you see on this slide has a role, plays a role in pleiotropic signaling. So you see all of these clinical features and the test writer will give you maybe some of these with either high levels of eosinophils or high levels of IgE. So that's what you need to know about IgE. That's pretty much it as far as the isotypes go. If you're sitting there and you're like, whoa, 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 dirty, hang on. What about IgD? Well, don't worry about that. It doesn't show up on exams. There's nothing to know. Just know that IgD is an isotype, but no buzzwords, no associations. Forget about it. So here's a summary slide of everything that we talked about. You can see on the left-hand side the different isotypes, the characteristics that you need to know. I included, just for completeness sake, whether they cross the placenta, fix complement, and are present in the breast milk. I don't really think that that's incredibly important to know. If you can know, you know which isotype uh, does cross the placenta in its association with a clinical association. So for example, in IgG, hemolytic disease of the newborn, yes, it crosses the placenta because IgG is involved in that clinical process. If you know the clinical association, then you're fine because that's really the only one that you have to worry about. And then for breast milk, IgA, that's, that's important to know. But besides that, don't worry about it. Just know what's on this table. Use some of my mnemonics if you find them helpful, but this is what you need to know for antibody isotypes.